So in the last part of 4.3, we're going to deal with some problems on concavity. And that has to do with the second derivative, as we saw at the last part of part 3 of this video. Okay. Alright, so let's go back to a problem that we kind of saw before with just first derivatives, but now we're going to mix in some concavity. Okay. So we want to sketch a graph of f of x. Again, this is a graph, not the graph. There's more than one graph that looks like this such that the first derivative is greater than 0 on negative infinity to 1. First derivative is less than 0 from 1 to infinity. Okay. Part B, the second derivative is greater than 0 from negative infinity to negative 2, and then from 2 to infinity, and it's less than 0 from negative 2 to 2. Okay. And then part C and D has to do with limits as x goes to infinity and negative infinity, which is going to have to do with from stuff from chapter 2, on uh, in behavior or horizontal asymptotes. Okay, so part A, it just mentions one value one. And it says your first derivative is greater than zero from negative infinity to one, and it's less than zero from one to infinity, which means that you have a max at x is equal to one. So the first thing we're going to do is come over here to x is equal to one, and I'm going to put a max let's just say up here somewhere, so we know that I have a local max. Okay. Now I me might need to go back and adjust that depending on where my endpoints are, where my end behavior is going on. Okay. But I do know that I have a local max, I just don't know exactly how high it is. And again, it could be at 3, it could be at 50. Okay. Alright, then for my second derivative in part B, it mentions negative 2 and 2. Okay. And it says that you are greater than zero from negative infinity to negative two. Remember, greater than zero means you're concave up. Less than zero in between means you're concave down. Concave up. Okay. All right. Places where you change concavity and where you are continuous, which I'm just going to assume that this function is continuous, are called inflection points. So at two, I have an inflection point. So if I come over to 2, I put an inflection point. Now I want to make sure that at 1 it's still a max. So I don't want to come over to 2 and put, a, put it above my maximum. It needs to be below my maximum. So let's just put it, say, here at 1.5. And, and I'm going to label that inflection point, IP. Okay. I also change concavity at negative 2. So at negative 2, I'm going to put in another inflection point. Okay. So right there. Right. And then part C and D are about in behavior. Part C says as you approach negative infinity, you get closer and closer to negative 2. Okay, so that means my graph should end up over here, down by negative 2. And as I go off to infinity, I should get closer and closer to 0. So I should end up over here. Okay. So the way that I like to draw these is from inflection point to inflection point, and then inflection point to another inflection point, or to the end of the graph. Okay. So between my two inflection points, I'm concave down, which means like I look like a parabola opening down with that local max. So I'm going to draw a parabola kind of shape opening downwards okay. from inflection point to inflection point. Okay. From 2 on, now I'm concave up. Now that doesn't mean that I'm a parabola opening up all the way. It means that I look like some part of a parabola opening up. So namely, I look like the left side of a parabola opening up down to this end behavior. Okay. Same thing over here. I am still concave up from negative 2 to negative infinity. But now I'm like the right side of a parabola opening up because I'm not actually going to turn around and open up. I'm not going to go like this because I have this in behavior over here that I'm supposed to approach negative 2. Okay. So again, that's a graph that matches all of these conditions. Again, there might be other graphs that also match all these conditions, um, but this is just the one that I, I chose with my maximums and where I chose to put my inflection points. Okay. Alright, well, let's look at another example. Um, Again, relating to the stuff that we just learned in the previous video. I identify the intervals where f of x is concave up, concave down, and then I identify inflection points. Okay. All 
Alright, now this is really exactly the same problem as you do for increasing and decreasing, except the word concavity or concave up or inflection points, all that should make you think of second derivatives. So we're going to do the same exact problem that we did with increasing and decreasing, but instead of using our first derivative, which is 12x cubed minus 12x squared minus 12x plus 12, we're going to take it one step further and take a second derivative. 36x squared minus 24x minus 12. And again, to figure out concave up or concave down, we're going to set this greater than 0 or less than 0. Okay. Now again, to solve those, what are we going to do? We're going to do it exactly like we did it with increasing and decreasing. We're going to factor. I always start factoring by factoring out common terms. So I can notice there's a 12 to factor out. 12 just sits there, and we're going to factor 3x squared as 3x and x, and it should work as minus 1, x minus 1, and 3x plus 1. Right. And this is going to give us two critical points, a right. negative 1 third right. and positive 1. Right. Now 12 can never be equal to 0, so that doesn't give you any, criti or any critical points or inflection points to put down. So we're just going to put negative one-third from 3x plus 1, and 1 from x minus 1. And again, just like increasing and decreasing, we're going to test. So I test, say, 2, and I get 12 is always positive. 3 times 2 plus 1 is positive. 2 minus 1 is positive, which means you are positive or concave up. Right. 0 okay, in between negative one-third and 1. We should get positive, positive, negative, which is negative, which means you're concave down. And a number less than negative one-third, let's say negative two. If we plug that in, we should get a positive, negative, negative, which will be positive, which means you're concave up. Okay. All right, so you're concave up from negative one-third to one. And concave down otherwise. So negative infinity to negative one third. Notice just like increasing, I don't use my endpoints. I always use open parentheses. Okay. Part B, inflection points. Right? <coughs> so inflection points are places where you change concavity. So you change concavity at negative one third and at one. Now, uh, these should be points, so I should say f of 1, plugging back into my original equation, I got 3 times 1 to the 4th, minus 4 times 1 to the 3rd, minus 6 times 1 squared, plus 12 times 1, plus 1, okay, so negative 1, negative 7, 5, 6, okay. So I have an inflection point at 1, 6. There's one of them. And then I also have an inflection point at negative one-third and whatever f of negative one-third happens to be. Okay, again, plugging into your original function. You should really do the arithmetic on that, turn that into a number. Okay. All right, let's continue. Take a look at another problem. Okay. <coughs> so same um, type of problem. We're going to... Uh, find intervals of concave up and concave down, and then inflection points. So again, the word concavity, or concave up or concave down, should make you think of derivatives or second derivatives. Okay. To take derivatives, I need to rewrite this as x to the minus 1. Again, I don't want to do this as a quotient rule. I want to use power rules and be as efficient as possible. And I get negative x to the minus 2 for my first derivative. My second derivative is 2x to the minus 3, which is 2 over x cubed when I switch it back. Okay. All right, now all the examples we've been looking at have been uh, more polynomial types where we set this equal to 0. But if you go back and look at your linear algebra, if I want to know when is this greater than 0, what you actually do is, you or sorry, your regular college algebra, um, when you want to figure out if a fraction is greater than zero, if it's less than zero, you figure out when is the top equal to zero. Well, that doesn't happen at all. And when is the bottom equal to zero? 
x cubed is equal to 0 at 0. And we want to put those numbers on the number line as well. Okay. Then we again test, like we did before, 1, say negative 1. And we plug it in. 2 over 1 cubed is 2 over a positive cubed, which is positive. If you're positive, that means you're concave up. Okay. Oops, sorry about that. Right. And same thing, I plug in negative 1, I get positive on the top for pos positive 2. Negative 1 cubed, all that's going to be negative, which means you're concave down. So you're concave up from 0 to infinity, and down from negative infinity to 0. Now the real reason I wanted to do this example is because... Most people will then say you have an inflection point at x is equal to 0. Okay? And this is not true. Okay? An inflection point has to be an ordered point. And if we try to take 0 and plug it back into my original function, we get that that doesn't happen. Okay? So we don't actually have a point at 0. So there is no inflection points. Okay. In fact, I drew this earlier this, when I wrote down the definition of an inflection point. Um, that you have to change or you have to change inflections, and it has to be an ordered point. And the example that I showed about it having to be an ordered point is actually the same thing: one over x. Okay. All right. So the last thing in this whole section is a pretty long section is the second derivative test. The second derivative test says that suppose your second derivative is continuous and your first derivative is equal to zero at some value c. And all this is saying is that you have a critical point. Okay, um, But it's a very specific critical point. It's a place where your derivative is equal to zero. It's not one of the places where your derivative is undefined. All right. It says, um, now, if your second derivative is greater than 0 at that critical point, you have a local min. Okay? Well, if your second derivative is greater than 0, that means you're concave up. And you can see, if you're concave up, that the bottom of a parabola is a local min. Okay? If your second derivative is less than 0, that means you're concave down. And if you're concave down, that means you have a max, or a local max. Okay? And then part three, this is where the second derivative test um, kind of sucks, honestly, is if your second derivative is equal to zero, the test is inconclusive. Right? Now, when it says inconclusive, what that means is that it literally tells you nothing. It doesn't say it's a max. It, does, it could be a max. It could be a min. It could be neither. So if this happens, you have to run first derivative test. So that's the increasing, decreasing to figure out uh, maxes and mints. So second derivative test has some advantages, i.e. it's faster sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't work. So in all, the first derivative test is a more useful one. Right? All right. So use the second derivative test to find local extrema for this function. Right? So to find local extrema, the first thing I want to do is find critical points. So I want to take my derivative, 12x cubed minus 12x squared minus 12x plus 12, and I want to set it equal to 0 to find critical points. All right. So to solve this, I can first divide everything by 12, make my life a little bit easier. All right. And now I have a third degree set equal to 0. And the technique I want to remind you guys of here is the algebraic technique called factor by grouping. Right? I'm sure you guys did it in your algebra class, um, but if you want more examples, you can always Google factor by grouping. I'll show you this one. Um, factor by grouping works by grouping usually your first two factors together. Always use a plus sign, and then put your second two factors together, i.e. you're grouping the terms together. Okay? Then out of my first parentheses, I'm going to factor out what's common, x squared. Right. 
And then to make this work, I need to make this parenthesis look like that same thing over here, x minus 1. So you might not think of anything being factored out of here, but I can actually factor out a negative 1, and that leaves me with x minus 1 in my parentheses. Okay. Alright, now you can see x minus 1 is common to both of these terms, so I can factor that out. Oops. What's going on here? Hold on. Hold on one second. Alright, so that leaves me with um, factoring out x minus 1, and that will leave me with x squared minus 1. Okay, let's we'll see if the next page works. So I can factor out x minus 1, and that leaves me with x squared minus 1 equal to 0. Alright x minus 1, and then x, mi x squared minus 1 factors as x minus 1, x plus 1 is equal to 0. Right. So we get x is equal to 1, x is equal to negative 1 are my two critical points. Alright, right. second derivative test, now what I'm going to do is take my second derivative. Alright, so there's my first derivative. My second derivative is going to be 36x squared minus 24x minus 12, and I'm going to plug both of these in. So f double prime of, let's start with the negative 1, negative 1 is equal to 36 times negative 1 squared minus 24 times negative 1 minus 12, and this gives me 36 plus 24 minus 12. Um, and all I need is that this is greater than 0. It's greater than zero, which means you are concave up, which means you have a local min at x is equal to negative one. Again, negative one is not the local min. You just have one at negative one. Okay? You plug negative one back into your original function to find your actual local min. All right. Second derivative at one is 36 times one squared minus 24 times one minus 12 is equal to 0. Okay. Alright, now if your second row is equal to 0, this means the test is inconclusive. Again, to figure out if this is a max or min, uh, your second row's test can't tell you. You might have one there, you might not. Okay. I think in this one it actually isn't a max or min. It's kind of a leveling off point. But again, that's not what inconclusive means. It means go back and run the first row's test to figure out what's going on. Okay. All right, so we've now completed this section, so make sure that you are completing the homework for 4.3. And as always, send me your questions either through email, ask my instructor on my math lab, or in the comments.